All right. Good evening, everyone. I, I feel like I have to be the, uh, the, the bad person that interrupts uh, a lot of great conversations uh, among uh, a lot of wonderful people, but it is for good reason. Uh, we, uh, we are in, all of us are in for a treat tonight and uh, over the course of this entire weekend. And uh, I'm so happy to welcome you here. My name is Seth Bodner. <laughs> And uh, I am the, uh, the president here at the University of Montana, and uh, it is my honor to serve in this role, and uh, it is my incredible honor to, uh, to, to welcome you all to the Montana Free Press Fest. Um, this is uh, just a, a terrific event and, and, and really uh, brings together uh, people from across our state to do one of the things that Montanans do best, and that is to gather together in a, in, in a spirit of, of, of respect, a spirit of curiosity to, uh, to be informed and to engage with issues that matter to Montanans uh, and, and to, to our fellow citizens across our entire country. Um, it is, uh, we're so excited to have partnered with the Montana Free Press to bring this event here to our university and, and to the public. You know, it was uh, a number of months back uh, when, when John Adams, the, uh, the uh, incredibly talented and driven uh, uh, executive director of Montana Free Press, reached out uh, to UM with an idea. And, uh, and it was just that, an idea. Uh, but it was an idea that we immediately said, I think in all uppercase letters, yes. Um, we are so grateful. Um, for John's leadership, for the entire team at Montana Free Press, um, to, to help bring together um, uh, an organization that is, that is focused on a free and, and unfettered press, uh, together with a university uh, that, that has a, at the core of its mission to, uh, to foster respectful, inform uh, dialogue and, and discourse across difference. Um, we are two public serving uh, institutions, both of which uh, are dedicated. Um, to giving Montanans access to information uh, and, and, and ideas. And uh, so we couldn't be happier. Um, and of course, uh, you know, this is a, a big partnership with uh, our School of Journalism. I see uh, Professor Lee Banville, ahead of our School of Journalism. Good to see you here, Lee. Thanks for being here as well. Um, you know, uh, one of the things we talk about at the School of Journalism and, and at the university, and I know is, is key to uh, the Montana Free Press is, is that we're dedicated to the idea of, of building individual freedom. Building individual freedom through knowledge and, and enabling community with others across the political and ideological spectrums. That's very important to us. And, and, and that objective um, and this event uh, are very timely. You know, the turbulent state of global affairs together with obviously what no doubt will be a, a very heated uh, presidential election in our country this fall, uh, it promises, uh, in fact guarantees, to uh, spark passionate dialogue. Of course, here in our classrooms, um, uh, but across our state, uh, across our region, uh, across our country, and across our dinner tables in our homes. And uh, tonight, we have a great conversation with uh, Timothy Egan that uh, will help us to, to better understand this moment in American politics and, and civic life more broadly. Um, you know, last week, uh, I challenged our campus to consider what it would look like for UM, uh, for our university to be recognized of, as a model for what healthy and sometimes difficult dialogue looks like. Uh, and, and in a message to campus, I asked, you know, what if Grizzlies were w to be widely known as choosing to engage with divergent ideas, to be courageously curious and to allow for all voices? What if our campus community were to embrace fully the principle of free expression, especially when it tests our own truths and understandings of the world? And I ask the same question of all of us here tonight and, and, and of all Montanans. What if we, in this time of, of, of heated political discourse in this country, what if we all choose to actively foster a climate of robust dialogue in which curiosity, respect, and a genuine desire 
for intellectual growth animates our conversations with one another. That's what we're here to do. Uh, you know, at the, at the University of Montana, our mission, I always summarize it with two words. Uh, that, that mission is inclusive prosperity. Uh, and a big part of that rests on our collective ability to listen across difference and to lean into discomfort as we seek to learn from nuanced perspective. We've actually codified this commitment uh, at UM uh, as, as our intention to, quote, model civil dialogue and practice civic engagement for and with one another. That's what this event is about. Uh, and, and another key partner that I want to mention that has been key to this is, is the Mansfield Center here at the University of Montana. Uh, the Mansfield Center was key in, in sponsoring tonight's event, and, and I know some of you have been to the Mansfield Dialogues, uh, which is uh, a, an embodiment of our university's commitment to this. And I, I think we have our director of our Mansfield Center here, Dina Mansour, thank you for being here. Um, and, uh, you know, it, really it carries on, that legacy of, uh, of Senator and, and Ambassador Mansfield and his commitment um, to this state and to this republic. You know, a university environment and an organization committed to free and independent journalism are two of the few institutions left in the public commons where we can build community with others from across the political and ide ideological spectrum. Spectrum. These are places where we're invited uh, to, to wrestle with complex topics and try again and again to explore, to test, to debate our, our beliefs, all with the goal of expanding and deepening our understanding. And I am so grateful and I am so excited that you've decided to join us here tonight and across this entire event um, in staying curious and, and in wrestling with uh, difficult topics in our community. And now I, I, I want to introduce you to, uh, to the mastermind uh, behind this inaugural event. Um, he is the, uh, the, the executive director and editor-in-chief of the Montana Free Press, Mr. John Adams. Um, and I want to welcome him up. As he's coming up, I'm going to talk about his background. Um, because this is, this is a person who's been, com who's been committed to strengthening and, and buttressing the fourth estate throughout his entire career. Um, you, uh, you know that he's, he's, he's reported on farming, he's reported on city government, the environment, state and local politics. Um, he, he's been a vital force in uh, preserving independent, informed journalism for Montanans. Um, he headed up the Great Falls Tribune's State House News Bureau in Helena, and he also served as the Montana correspondent for USA Today. Uh, and, and then he decided in 2016 that, you know, I, I need to go start my own thing. Uh, and that's when he founded the independent nonprofit, the Montana Free Press. Um, and this event is, uh, is, is a result of his passion, of his commitment to this state uh, and, and to this republic. And I am deeply grateful for him. Uh, and we're lucky to have him here in Missoula and here uh, in Montana. So without further ado, Mr. John Adams. Hello, everyone. Thank you, and welcome to the inaugural Free Press Good Fest. Stuff. Good, good stuff. Um, yeah. Um, it is really exciting to be in this room with all of you, and uh, thank you, President Bodner, for those kind words, and, and thank you to the President Bodner and the, the community here at uh, the University of Montana for supporting this event and making it possible, and for, for being our host, and, and for helping us make it such a special thank event. You. I'm really excited about the next few days. Uh, we've got some great conversations, we've got some great topics, um, and we've got a great community here uh, in which to, to host this conversation. Um, one of the reasons it's so good to be back here in Missoula and why I think it's so appropriate for us to host this event, this inaugural event here, uh, is because Montana Free Press was founded in this town just a few blocks away over at the uh, uh, Missoula Public Library, the, the old library basement. Um, in two th February 2016, we had our first board meeting and, and Montana Free Press was born. Um, so the, Montana Free Press has deep roots in the Missoula community and it's, it's great for us to be here and to share this with all of you. And also Missoula shows up. Um, so thank to all of you for being here. Um, that was back in February of 2016, and back then we didn't really, we didn't have any employees. I wasn't even getting paid. Uh, it was just me and my strongly held belief that Montanans care deeply about their state, 
They value reliable, in-depth, accurate news and information. And they understand that the critical role that journalism plays in stitching together the fabrics of our community. Eight and a half years later, I can say I was right. Uh, about those beliefs because Montana Free Press readers now number in the hundreds of thousands each month and more than 4,000 of them step up to financially support our work um, which is what makes this possible. Uh, it's because of those readers and supporters that we're all here today. Um, Montana Free Press has nearly 20 employees now located throughout Montana in places like Helena, Billings, Great Falls, Bozeman, and here in Missoula. In fact, I'm thrilled to announce yeah, I can, we're good? Okay, good. Uh, I'm thrilled to announce that we recently partnered with the University of Montana School of Journalism to launch a new local reporting fellowship. Veteran Montana reporter and UMJ school grad Katie Fairbanks joined our team last month thanks to this first of a kind partnership with the journalism school and we're very excited to bring a locally focused reporter right here to Missoula. All right. We're, we're going to talk a lot more about journalism and about collaboration and the future of news over the next couple of days, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that right now. Uh, but I think it's important that we talk briefly about why we're here tonight. Uh, President Bodner did a great job of, of kind of leaning into this in, in his opening remarks. Um, but the reason we created this festival is because we believe that Montanans should have an opportunity to participate in the conversations that will shape our state's future. And if you're going to be prepared to participate in those conversations, then you need to be informed. And it's our job as journalists to tell the stories that keep people informed and give them the tools that they need to effectively participate in those conversations. And so that's what Montana Free Press Fest is all about. It's about telling some of those stories live on stage and creating opportunities for you, the public, to be involved in those conversations. So we're very grateful to all of you for being here, and we're also grateful to all the people, the businesses, the uh, institutions, and community members that help make this exciting event possible. And with that, I want to thank a few of our sponsors tonight. For starters, a massive thank you um, to the UM School of Journalism, the REN, the Montana Community Foundation, the Bacchus Institute, and of course, the University of Montana. And a very special thanks to our partners at the Mansfield Center uh, here at UM. Their generous uh, sponsorship of tonight's ev uh, event made this possible um, as part of the Mansfield Dialogues program, which we're very excited to be a part of uh, with this opening keynote conversation. Uh, and I also personally want to thank the tireless team of folks at Montana Free Press, the staff, the contractors, the volunteers, the organizers who put in hundreds if not thousands of hours uh, collectively to make this event possible. So thank you to all of you for your commitment to this. It was, yes. <laughs> we had this idea a long time ago, but I got to tell you, the last few months have been pretty crazy. Um, so thanks to everybody for putting in that effort. And finally, uh, everyone who is here tonight, we want to welcome you to stick around after the conversation. Um, we're going to uh, celebrate the opening of this inaugural Free Press Fest uh, with some drinks and appetizers and conversation. So after the conversation tonight, stick around and join us uh, to continue the conversation a little later into the evening. Um, Timothy Egan is a National Book Award winning author and acclaimed writer and veteran chronicle of the American experience, whose interests range widely across history and landscape, and into the spiritual realm. He is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, a popular columnist, and author of 10 books. We're going to discuss his most recent book here tonight, A Fever in the Heartland, The Ku Klux Klan's Plot to Take Over America and the Woman Who Stopped Them. In addition to being a New York Times bestseller, A Fever in the Heartland was named a Washington Post notable work of fiction, NPR's best book of the year, Kirkus Review's Best Book of the Year, Chicago Review of Books' Best Book of the Year, New York Public Library's Best Book of the Year, and Goodreads Choice Award finalists, among many other accolades, including those that came from my mother earlier this summer. <laughs> Thanks to your mother. <laughs> who implored me to read this book. You've got to read this book. You've got to read this book. I finally read this book, and then I said, we've got to get this guy to come talk. Um, so thanks, Mom. And thanks, Mom and Dad, for driving across the country to be here tonight. Um, <laughs> the New York Times has called Tim a master storyteller for his nonfiction account of Montana's second territorial governor in The Immortal Irishman, the Irish revolutionary who became an American hero. 
Also a New York Times bestseller, The Immortal Irishman recounts the improbable life of Thomas Francis Marr, a Victorian rebel who was banished to Tasmania by the, by the English, escaped to America, and fought for the Union in the American Civil War. It, it, it's in the, Tim was previously a regular New York Times opinion columnist on topics ranging from politics to the environment to the American West, and as a reporter, he was part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize for the series How Race is Lived in America. I'm very excited for Tim to be here tonight in conversation, and with that, please join me in welcome, welcoming Tim Egan to the stage. Tim, thank you so much for being here tonight, for traveling, uh, not too far. Not too far, no. Yeah, for uh, joining us, uh, almost neighboring states. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot of things tonight, but just to kick things off, um, help set up your latest book, A Fever in the Heartland. Tell us what it's about, how you got interested in this topic, um, and why, it's, right. why, why we're talking about it today. So I'll get into that in just a minute, but first of all, I want to thank your mom. <laughs> she has really good taste. <laughs> I want to thank the Mansfield Center. I want to thank Montana Free Press. I am just thrilled to be on this late summer day back in Montana. I have long-standing family ties here. My family was Butte Irish. Anybody knows what that is? <laughs> they were the toughest sons of bitches in the world. Yes. And they say at one point more Gaelic was spoken in Butte than anywhere outside of Dublin. So that's on my mother's side. My nephew owns here in Missoula what I think, in my unbiased way, is the best brewery in Missoula, Highlander Brewery. Uh, it's Riley Egan. I don't know if he's here tonight. And this morning I woke up on the Yak River in the wildest part of the lower 48, went out at sunrise and caught myself a fat rainbow on a dry fly and then drove down through all this beauty along the Flathead, along the Clark Fork, through a wildfire in Knoxon, just you know, a few feet away off the road, just burning wildfire, and, and here I am. And I'm just ecstatic to be here. I love Montana, I've always loved Montana. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in my DNA, so thank you. This is a, an easy lift for me. Now, the story of the Klan is, is I don't set out to do these kinds of things. I'm a, so sort of serendipitous storyteller. I, 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 I'm open to ideas. And if you're open to ideas, stuff happens, or you can stumble upon stuff. So I have this wonderful quote from Harry Truman, who you don't think of when you think of witty aphorisms, but he said, the only thing new in this world is the history we do not know. And this Klan story was a history I did not know, and most people who've read the book have told me the same thing. Now, you know, as a writer, and you know this as a journalist, you're looking for stuff that hasn't been largely told. And so I, 10, 15 years ago, I was in Helena talking to a politician, and I said, you know, who's the guy on the statue? And he says, you call yourself an Irishman. <laughs> and you don't know who Thomas Francis Mars. I go, no, I've never heard of the guy. He affected millions of lives on three continents. I mean, he helped to free Australian prisoners in the island of Tasmania where he, was, where he escaped, as you mentioned. Millions of African Americans are free in part because of the blood struggle that the Irish Brigade gave in the Civil War when they had to prove their citizenship by their lives. And finally, he comes here to Montana and becomes your second territorial governor, and now he's on a statue. It's a hell of a life. He does all this, and he dies at like 43 years old. So that was a history I did not know. Big Burn, my other Montana book, which took place in 1910. So, you know, I grew up in Spokane. And we had nine, big family of nine, big Irish Catholic family. We didn't have any a summer home. We had public land. That was our summer home. So we'd camp in this big canvas tent. You know, my parents smoked. <laughs> so I inhaled a lot of secondhand smoke at a young age and roamed all over Montana and Idaho. And I heard this sort of almost mythic tale of the fire of 1910. And, and every now and then you'd see one of these charred skeletal remains 
of a white pine. This used to be the largest white pine area in the world. And you know, someone would talk about the fire. And then I started covering you know, wildfires as a New York Times correspondent and got to know a lot of smoke jumpers who are incredibly cool people. Most of them, and I've learned, some of them are like pursuing master's degrees in obscure subjects while fighting wildfires. So that was a story I didn't know. Then finally, the Klan. I'd always heard that Oregon, which you think of as such a woke state, had a Klan governor. And they did. A hundred years ago this year, 1924, they voted for an open Klansman as their governor. They also were the first and only state in the United States to vote by public vote to outlaw Catholic schools. Now, why did they want to outlaw Catholic schools? Irish and Italians. Klan hated immigrants. Hated immigrants. That was one of the big things. They've shut down these schools. It was the same reason the Klan was behind prohibition. They were huge supporters of prohibition. If it can keep them out of the saloons, if it can shut down their schools, we'll shut down not only the social lubricant, but the places where they meet. So I was going to write this book about the Oregon Klan. But then everyone goes, oh my god, you got to go to Indiana. That's where it really happened. I said, Indiana? Are you kidding me? You know, we think of the Klan as a southern thing. And in fact, the first iteration of the Klan came about for one simple reason. Four million Americans who had been enslaved, enslaved were now citizens. And they rose to keep them from having their rights as Americans. But in Indiana, one in three white males in the 1920s put their hand on a Bible with a hood on and swore to God to forever uphold white supremacy. And that the implication of that swearing was that they would hate millions of their fellow Americans. They joined in the putting their hand on that Bible, the nation's oldest domestic terror group. A third of them, a third of them. Then they elected a Klan governor. They had two Klan senators. All nine members of Congress were Klansmen. They had what Time Magazine called a Klan Republic. So it was kind of a, you'll excuse my French, a, a holy shit moment for me that became a number of holy shit moments. I'm sure your mom's not upset with me. Um, She's also Irish Catholic. OK, so. we'll get that. <laughs> and she does understand me. Good, I like that. Uh, and I just I can't think, what an incredible story. And how come I didn't know this? I'm reasonably well informed. This is my 10th book. I spent 30 years at the New York Times. I just absorb information like a sponge. I love it. I knew nothing about this. Where did this history go? How did this history get down to the memory hole? So that's the story I wrote. And it, it's, there's, it, like all great history, it has lots of echoes to today. Like all great history, it has terrible people. In this case, a monster. The, the, the head of the Klan in Indiana was a rapist, sexual predator, and ultimately a murderer while preaching you know, abstinence for women and prohibition. He was a raging alcoholic and a bootlegger, too, while preaching prohibition. So, and then there was a woman. And I'm always also interested, not just in how institutions fail, which is a good sub-theme of this book. And I hope people can learn from it today about that our guardrails, which we think are so strong, are not that strong. But also, and I'm always interested in this, people who get written out of history, they live at the margins. I found a lot of them when I did my book on the Dust Bowl. I was speaking with mostly women who were in their 90s, and they were telling me this amazing story about climate change, essentially, about when the Earth was turned inside out. And they're in the last days of their life. These women are 97, 98. And I'm sitting in a little circle in Oklahoma, and they're telling me this story. And I'm going, how, how, do these, how do these brave people get written out of this history? So the Klan book at its core has a woman who changes history. Now, I'm going to spoil the story a little bit. I shouldn't do this. My kids always say, Dad, you shouldn't give it away. Make them buy the book. <laughs> she gives up her life. She gives up her life. She's a martyr, an accidental heroine in this. So the story is, I wanted to write a TikTok. I wanted to write a textual book, almost like a novel. Pay, you know, chapter and verse, how did a middle American society, the heartland, you know, that we celebrate in our movies and our poems and everything, how did these great Mayberry Americans turn to hate? How do these 
God-fearing, you know, there was Protestant ministers preaching hate from the pulpit. How do these people put, they had a Ku Klux kiddies, 10 and 11-year-olds who put on their little hoods and would go into their dens and also swear to hate their neighbors. So that's, that's a long way of saying, uh, and again, serendipity was nice to me. I was lucky. I found a terrific story and a story I knew nothing about. You know, that was one of the things, anybody who's read this book, I think, has that reaction, right? I mean, almost nobody knows this history. And, you know, I think sometimes as journalists, we encounter stories where we think, you know, this, this is too wild. This is too, right. this, this seems too incredible to be true. Uh, I, was there a point where you had to wrestle with the sort of what you were discovering in terms of the facts you were digging up around the Ku Klux Klan um, and this monster, Stevens? Yeah, and I had to do all this during COVID, too. So I spent a lot of time in Indiana, locked up with this bastard, basically living 100 years. Because when you, know, when you write these histories, you, you live the period. And a couple of really cool things happened, actually. Louis Armstrong cut the first black jazz record in Richmond, Indiana, on the same day that they held the largest Klan rally in their history, 40,000 Klansmen in a Klan airplane. And he was in this little sound shed with 11 other black jazzmen. And they cut this first record that went on to sell zillions of copies. Then they got on the train and got out of town while this rally's going on. So, so I always look for little things like that, little flourish, little, little bits of light in the middle of this. So I'm living this history, and it, it really is dark. And this is the, I've written nine books of nonfiction and one novel. A novel is really hard to write because it has to pass the smell test. And you're just making crap up. It really is. A novel is all lies. But nonfiction, I hold, I hold myself to really high standards, as I know you do at the Montana Free Press. And so this is the only time I ever did this. I put a little, one sentence at the front of the book that said, the following story is true. And I have you know, 80 pages of source notes in the back. No one's challenged me on any of this because I triple checked it. But I didn't think people were going to believe it. But, so I just thought I, I'm going to put all this detail in. I'm going to put it in in a storytelling way. You're going to see how it started. How did Indiana go this way? What's, so that we could learn from it, too. So it become kind of a, you know, history's not a dead thing. And I think, by the way, there's no such thing as boring history. There's only boringly told history. And people who don't love history don't, you don't realize how alive it is today. So I thought, if I just do this thing, and they see this villain for who he is, and they feel these human beings, and they see this thing, they can learn from it. And um, but yeah, it was a huge challenge to get. OK, I'll just give you one example. Again, the first stereotype is the Klan is all about the South. President Ulysses Grant destroyed that Klan. And if you read Ron Chernow's book, has anyone read Ron Chernow's book on Grant? Fabulous book. He gives him his due because Grant was sort of known as a drunk. And you know, he, Lincoln famously said about him because Grant was one of the first generals to win some battles in the Civil War when the Union wasn't winning very many of them. And someone said, but, but Grant's a drunk. And Lincoln said, well, find out what he's drinking and give it to these other generals <laughs> because he, he was victorious. But as a president, he wailed on the Klan. He called them the biggest threat to democracy that ever arose. They were night riding through the South and hanging and burning and pillaging and robbing. And there were white women down there who were teaching African Americans to read and write. And they would string them up and they would rape them. They were just, they were just a total terror group. And Grant shut them down. They were gone by the 1870s. They passed a series of laws, the Ku Klux Klan Acts. He put 10,000 of them in jail. They were gone. And then 50 years later, they rise from the mist. And where do they rise? In the north. I mean, they're, they're still active in the south, but they've got a whole new range of people to hate. Remember, the original Klan hated blacks. One of the reasons they fought evolution, because they thought, if we believe in evolution, that is a belief that blacks come from a common ancestor. And they couldn't accept that they were a common ancestor with whites. So they, they fought big time in the Scopes Monkey Trial and all of that. But so this thing rises up out of the mist with a new range of hatreds. And who, this, who are the new people they hate? Well, immigrants. 
the usual immigrants, Irish and Italian, but added to that are two new groups, Jews. We're getting our first big surge of Jews. My wife is Jewish and makes for interesting holidays. And she's, her family fled the pogroms of Russia. Most of these Russians, most of the American Jewish people who came in the early 20th century were fleeing pogroms. Three million of them came in the first um, 25 years of the 20th century. People go, wow, well, they're not Christian. A lot of them don't speak English. They're sort of clannish. Now, two of those three things they said about the Irish. You know, they spoke Gaelic, and they were clannish. And they were Roman Catholic, which is a foreign thing to the clan. Secondly, there's Southern Europeans are coming. Sicily sent a million people here in 25 years because they couldn't make a living on that hard land. And they had a huge earthquake, which alone prompted 800,000 of them to come. And they look different. They're somewhat dark skinned. They're Catholic, also hang out together. So they, that's another group of immigrants. So that's, that's a, that gives them a whole hatred opportunity. Blacks, immigrants. And now you have people like my grandmother from Butte, who moved to Seattle and was a flapper. And she used to go out to the speakeasies at the edge of town. She said, oh, we had the time of our life. We drank bathtub gin and listened to black jazz till 3 in the morning. This is in the jazz age, Great Gatsby. The Klan was freaked out by these socially liberated women. They wanted them hearth and home. Now, remember what had happened in 1920? Women were given the vote. So they're not only an equal partner in this democracy of ours, but now they're throwing off the social mores. And they're, they don't, they're, you know, they're going out and they're partying and they're doing things that just totally freaks them out. So the Klan has this little, they had these their little militias in Indiana that would go break up the speakeasies and harass these women. Go home, go home, go home to your husband. I don't have a husband. Well, then go home anyway. So they have this whole range of new hatreds um, and that allowed them to expand. That was one of the, that's what I tried to just give a context to why it was ripe for recruitment then. Well, and what was really interesting to me in this book is, you know, I would always thought of the Klan as the invisible empire and that their activities were putting on their hoods and their masks and their robes and riding out on horses and, and lynching blacks under, you know, the, the secrecy of night, right? The right. darkness of night. What was really um, shocking and, you know, quite frankly, terrifying to me was the extent to which the Klan in the 1920s in Indiana was, they weren't just open, they, they were, they were, they were running for office on a Klan platform. Right. They were running openly as Klan members and being elected to office and passing policies openly as, as Klan members. They never tried to hide, even though they were called the Invisible Empire. And that was part of their recruitment power was because they said, you felt really powerful. You were one under the hood. You know, you were, you were in the secret society with all your little rituals and hand signals. And they had their own language. And they, you'd see these road signs all over Indiana. That would, you, they'd give out stickers that we would put in the store. Uh, T, trade with Klan, T-W-K. And that was a way, and then they would also separate the Jewish stores. They would hold these meetings and say, don't shop at these places, they're owned by Jews. And they'd take it, <coughs> excuse me, take a TWT cake sticker and put it on there. <coughs> so yeah, they were, at election time, they would send out a ballot. And it was, they had a little clothespin to it, clothespin to the ballot, and they saturated the state. And it said on this ballot, the Klan ticket, the one true American ticket is what they called it, the 100% American, that was their euphemism they didn't want to say Klan. They would just say, we're 100% American. And the Ford dealers would have signs that say, you know, our staff is only 100% American. By the way, Henry Ford, one of the amazing little factoids, when you bought a Model T in the 1920s, Ford was a huge anti-Semite. When you bought a Model T, you got an owner's manual, manual, and you also got one of the biggest, most popular frauds to ever hit America. Protocols of the Elders of Zion, this supposed conspiracy of Jews to control the world that Ford gave out to every person who purchased a Model T. But yeah, so they were incredibly open. One of his ways of D.C. Stevenson, the Grand Dragon, the evil guy who's ultimately brought down, and the guy who creates the state, he's, a, he's sort of a music man of hate. He goes from town to town, you know, 
we've got trouble right here in River City. And, you know, it's those immigrants. It's those Catholics. It's those Jews. It's those flappers. But <clears throat> he's really brilliant in one sense. He had this sort of multiple point plan to take over Indiana, which he did in four short years. He was a drifter. He was an alcoholic. He'd been kicked out of the army. He completely ditched his wife and young kid, said, don't even try to find me. Left him behind in Oklahoma. Shows up in Evansville, Indiana in 1921. He's selling door-to-door -door stuff. And he reads this little item in the paper, says, Klan shows up at church meeting, surprises minister. Well, 12 Klansmen went into this Protestant church Sunday service and bribed the minister. They were wearing their hoods. They gave him an envelope. They said, this is for the good service you were doing. So he thought, aha, if I can sanctify America's oldest domestic terror group and give them the sort of sheen of you know, religion. And he quickly bribed hundreds of ministers and got them to preach the word of hate in a religion that's based on love thy neighbor as thyself. It was, it was masterful in some ways. Now, they also preached against Catholics, preached against blacks, and all of that. But that was one of his, and they were absolutely open. It's so funny, John, because you know, I read a million newspapers, and they're all, you, know, you, you couldn't open a newspaper in Indiana without seeing a Klan headline. But a lot of them were really laudatory. Um, the, the newspaper in Noblesville, which is where the trial, the last third of this book, takes place, Every day in their daily ran something called Klan Comment. It was spelled K-L-A-N-K-O-M-M-E-N-T. And it was a little aphorism about how good the Klan was. It was just a little, like a little Boy Scout aphorism. And you'd see these things, Klan to you know, have fireworks show. They had a Klan baseball team with KKK stitched across their jerseys. Um, they gave out presents to orphans at Christmas. So they were, they were, they were in no way an invisible emperor. Look at the pictures in this book, and I had to have a lot of pictures for the doubters. You'll see the Ku Klux Kitties, you'll see the Women's Brigade, and you'll see the parades where they're marching in Muncie, in Indianapolis, and in Evansville. Now, the hardest part for me, you know, I, I worked on a farm. I, I know a lot of farm people. When I was growing up, I worked on a hay farm in Northeast Washington, and um, he just co-opted these rural people. And in Kokomo, Indiana, on the 4th of July, 1923, 200,000 people turned out in their Klan robes to welcome D.C. Stevenson, the Grand Dragon, descend from the sky in his Klan biplane with the KKK letters underneath, drop out in his, in his purple robe, and they bowed down to him like he was Jesus Christ. To this day, it's the largest Klan gathering in history. Nothing in the South has ever come close to little Kokomo, Indiana, 200,000 people turning out. Now, I went to Kokomo when my book came out. I was a little afraid. <laughs> I was like, are you sure you want to include Kokomo on in the tour? Um, it was a huge surprise. I got a crowd the size of this. They wanted to hear this history. Now, the interesting thing was, a lot of them had started to do some research, and they said, yeah, I realized Grandpa was a Klansman. I never realized it before, but now I think that story went into the memory hole, like I said. Mm -hmm. But they were, now, can you embrace your Grandpa who's a Grandpa, who's a Klansman? Yeah, you just see them in a more nuanced way um, than you did before. I, I want to get to that point in a little bit here uh, about you know, how, we, how we revisit history and, and think about how it, it affects us today. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, the, some of what you mentioned with the newspapers. Um, yeah. This is an era, 1920s, where there were a lot more newspapers around back then than there are today, uh, to say the least. Um, but a lot of these papers, uh, it wasn't just papers that were owned or, or published by the Klan itself. But there were a lot of newspapers that were basically in the pocket of the Klan, that were right. sympathetic to the Klan, that editorialized uh, in favor of the Klan. Um, but that wasn't all of them. And there were a handful of very courageous um, editors, journalists, who saw this for what it was and stuck to 
their guns in reporting on right. D.C. Stevenson and the activities of the Klan. Can you talk a little bit about that? Maybe talk specifically about uh, George Dale. Right. And, you know, this is a good and bad press story. We're here to pay homage to the struggling free press, but this is a good and bad story about one of our guardrails. This is the golden age of newspapers. Every town of about 10,000 or more had a daily. If you had 50,000 people in your town, you probably had three daily newspapers. If you were in Indianapolis, you had 12 daily newspapers. It was that people read papers back, these things were you know, 80 pages, fat with ads. It was the golden age of journalism. Right now, we lose two newspapers every week. We've lost two thirds of all journalists since 2005 and a third of, of all the newspapers. So this was the golden age. But just as you said, they wanted to be popular. And the Klan was popular. There's no getting around it. They didn't take over Indiana by you know, surf it by sneaking in and masking who they were. They were damn open about who they were. And the press aided and abetted them. There's a scene in this book, a great reporter, a brave reporter, who nearly died, in fact, covering John Nyblick, went on to become a judge. And he says, one of his fellow reporters in Indianapolis came up and said, uh, hey, I want you to come out to this meeting with me tomorrow. He says, what's the meeting? He goes, well, we're going to join the Klan. He goes, join the Klan? I thought they hate all these people. He goes, no. He goes, he goes, why do you want me to join the Klan? He said, everybody's joining the Klan. So there was a herd mentality. If you don't go along, you'll somehow be left out. And they really did fail. They really did. Their state, the Chicago Tribune, 10 years after this was over, said this was an American horror story. This was an example how a free state got taken over by a terror group. And it happened in broad daylight. And the press failed them. There were two guardrails that I give credit to. One you mentioned. There's this guy named George Dale. He was five foot one, 102 pounds at most. He was a wet noodle of a man, had nine kids. He ran his little free press, his little newspaper in Muncie, Indiana. And he saw what was going on early on. He sniffed this thing out. There were Klan judges. Klan prosecutors. Certainly were a lot of Klan cops. Uh, Malcolm X famously said a lot of people exchanged their sheets for a badge. And that's sort of what happened in a lot of places in the 20s. He sniffed the whole scheme out. And he reported it. And he made fun of him. He laughed at him. So they haul this guy, this editor of the Muncie newspaper, before a Klan judge. And he throws him in jail in a penal farm without even habeas corpus. He doesn't get a trial. And so that's why the Chicago Tribune said the First Amendment did not have any effect in the state of Indiana. They just threw him in jail. Good luck with that. You know, I mean, Andrew Jackson famously said when a Supreme Court decision went against him, well, how many soldiers does the Supreme Court have? Are they going to show up with their militia? You know, so we, this thing is built on this sort of fragile, we're, we're all following the rule of law. You know, until it's broken. And that's what happened there. So Dale was heroic. Now, Franklin Roosevelt later commuted everything, gave him a clean record, and George Dale became mayor of Muncie, Indiana, which was really cool. He got Catholics and blacks and everyone else who hated the Klan, and he, got, he ended up as their mayor. So it's a pretty cool story. But, but by and large, I cannot give my beloved, look, I love this profession. It made me who I am. But I can't give us much credit. The other institution was the University of Notre Dame. Now, it's the Catholic Citadel, and the Klan hated Catholics. When everyone else fell, again, press, judiciary, um, certainly the politicians, the University of Notre Dame stood, and D.C. Stevens and the Grand Dragon said, I'm going to show these little smart-ass Catholic kids who runs this state. He sent 20,000 Klansmen up by train to wail on these kids at Notre Dame. They get off the train, and they're going to have this massive rally. Well, and the Notre Dame president says, just don't engage them. Stay on campus. Don't go down there. They disobeyed the Notre Dame president. It's a small school, only 1,200 boys. They were all males. They go down, and these college kids wail on the Klan. <laughs> and it was, you couldn't have a more stereotypical Irish-American thing. They threw potatoes at them. 
They got sacks of potatoes and threw them at them. And the clan starts running, fleeing. They go, oh God, you know, they run up in this thing and they, their little clan headquarters with the KKK letters up there and the cross, burning cross, and they, and they cower behind these. And one of them, guys, was, uh, was the Notre Dame quarterback of the four horsemen. Now, this is the great part of the story. And it's, as Henry Kissinger said, it has the added value of being true. <laughs> the next day, there's headlines across the Midwest, including Chicago. Notre Dame students rout clan. It gave birth to the Fighting Irish. And to this day, they're called the Fighting Irish because of the May 18th, 1924 riot that um, the kids of Notre Dame did. They were just sick and tired of being told that they were others, that they weren't uh, true Americans. And that, that's what the Klan was all about. It was about the othering. And that's what we have a lot of today, too. If you can other someone, if you can somehow make them less American, then it's easier to hate them. Now, that riot was the high point. They never, there was a, an Irish American lawyer named Patrick O'Donnell, and he teamed up with a rabbi and an African American publisher, and they founded this newspaper, this magazine called Tolerance. And once a week, they had a snitch inside the Klan. Once a week, they would print massive list of members of the Klan. So they're breaking the invisible empire. There'd be 10,000 names on a given, and big headline, who's who in bed sheets. <laughs> and so they're, they're doxing them. They're outing them. And they go, great, well, we've broken the invisible empire. This will finally show them. It had the opposite effect. Instead of shaming them, it proved to be validating. Because people opened this up and they said, oh, well, my banker is a Klansman. And my minister is a Klansman. And so and so down the street, I didn't know. I, I better join, just like the pressure to join. So the editor of Tolerance admitted his, his whole campaign to dox them had completely failed. Hmm. Oh, there's, this is such an incredible book. If you haven't already uh, gotten hooked on it, if you haven't already read it, uh, I'm sure you're, you're going to run out and buy it uh, after this. And we could talk forever about this book. I want to, uh, one, one last question on this particular uh, topic, and then I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, you've kind of referenced a couple of times uh, the echoes of this right. history. Um, talk a little bit about uh, where you see or hear some of those echoes today as it right. relates to our current mm -hmm. political and media environment. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, I was trying to come up with the perfect metaphor, and I still haven't, but since I'm in Montana, it's like a vein, like under underground vein, a copper vein that runs through our history. And it's a vein of hatred. Now, we're certainly not unique. My wife's people fled one of the most awful places in the world. You know, these people were wailing on Jews, and, you know, we Irish have fought among ourselves for centuries. So it's not unique to America, but there's a vein of hatred. And when I wrote my book about Thomas Francis Moore, I realized the Irish were the first because there was the second biggest political party in 1852 was a party called the Know Nothing Party, the proud Know Nothing Party. And they called, were called that because if they were ever you know, taken by the authorities, they were to say, I know nothing. Um, and their main platform, their whole thing, was to keep Irish immigrants from becoming citizens. So I'm, I'm researching this book, and I go, wow, this is a real vein that kind of runs through us. Then you see it pop up in the 20s because there's social tumult going on. There's change in society. All the stuff I mentioned, the socially liberated women, all the immigrants, uh, just, just a, lot of a lot of soldiers coming home from World War II. 100,000 black soldiers coming home from World War II and realizing they couldn't be citizens in most, in most of the South, in the Jim Crow South, that they just fought for their country and yet they couldn't vote in you know, 18 states in the South, which was moving north too. So all the social tumults going on. I see that thing pop up. If it's a vein, it's, it's now on the surface. It had been way below ground, and it's on the surface. We think we killed it, or we think we buried it. I mean, again, I'm trying to search for my metaphor. I don't want to mix my metaphor, but I've seen it all over the place in the last four or five years. And this is my not original theory on this. It's in large part because of social media, because Haters used to cluster, I mean, random haters, not the Klan, which was an organized hatred. They used to cluster in small little groups, hide, secret. And now they have 
a community. And the community is on social media. And I'm sorry to say this, but this is how I feel very strongly about this. I think since Elon Musk bought Twitter and made it into X, it's a sewage of mistruths and lies and, and just total garbage. It allows haters to find things to validate their points of view. What's my example of that? Did you all follow the riots in England in the last month? They had some of the worst violent mob attacks that they've had in 100 years. And it was people attacking immigrants, burning them, burning down the hospital that kept them, running them out, because they'd read something on Elon Musk's platform that said immigrants were behind this horrible stabbing of a teenage girl. They weren't. It was a mistruth. But when you don't have any media gatekeepers and you just open up the sewage grates and let it all flow through, you're going to find your haters. So my theory is that, yeah, they used to be small in number and they didn't really have a community and they didn't, you know, they didn't have validation and they were ashamed to say it. You know, they whispered. I mean, I covered the famous Aryan Nations. Remember that neo-Nazi group in Idaho? Um, and I remember interviewing Richard Butler and <laughs> I shouldn't have done this. This is one time when I broke objectivity. I, I spent two hours interviewing him and he just talks about Hitler, how great he was and how awful the Jews are. I finally closed my notebook and I said, my wife's Jewish, so are my kids. Thanks for the interview. <laughs> and I just left it at that. But so now they have a community. And they have a community because we have so one half of all Americans, the Pew Center just did this survey, one half of all Americans get their news from social media. I wish they got it from the Montana Free Press. Um, because no matter what people think of you, if they think you're too liberal or too whatever, you at least have professional people who fact check things before you allow it to go out. That's the thing. Yeah, reporters probably have liberal biases because they're not paid well, and people who aren't paid well tend to have liberal biases. You know, they're <laughs> teachers or whatever else. If reporters were millionaires, they'd most of you are Republicans. That's one of my theories, too. <laughs> But at least almost all good reporters have standards. They will fact check. And you know if you read something like that, you can be reasonably assured that it's been fact checked. But then you open up the sewage grate, like Musk has, and he's a very powerful billionaire who's just more and more, to me at least, now I've been an opinion writer for the last 12 years, so I'm free to have an opinion. <laughs> I'm out of the fair and balanced field now. <laughs> Musk looks like a Bond villain to me. I mean, he really does. He's like this dark character manipulating all these things. And, and he's, since he's come over to Trump, he's full supporter. He's just putting his foot on the pedal. He really is. He had a picture he ran yesterday of Kamala Harris in a, in a communist czar or in a communist um, a dictator outfit with a hammer and sickle, you know, red uniform, and said, what do you make of this? Well, it's complete AI-generated crap. But he, you know, 40 million people saw it. Would the Montana Free Press do that? You know, I mean, that's, that's what bothers me. And Better not, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you touch on a number of topics that we're going to be talking about over the yeah. next couple of days, too, which is great. So, uh, you know, the future of news, AI, social media, these are all things that we're going to be exploring over the coming days. So um, I think that's a great uh, segue into, think, in, into talking a little bit more about uh, what we've got coming up. But I wanted to, I wanted to touch on, I, I would be negligent if I didn't ask you to talk a little bit more about um, the man immortalized in the giant bronze statue erected on the north lawn of the Montana Capitol that you referenced earlier. Right. In our, in our, another journalist, it turns out. Um, talk a little bit more about uh, our I, I just I just absolutely fell in love with this guy. He was a Victorian gentleman, and he wrote long, uh, there's a 10-page there's a letter in the center of the book that he wrote to this woman he was courting. And he said, and he came from wealth. He was very well educated and was a, was a Victorian writer, you know, the whole thing, romantic in the heart. He writes this 10-page letter. He says, he's in America now. He's escaped. So I'll just give you the real short sketch of him. He's born into wealth, but in the 1840s and the 1950s, a million Irish will die from famine. Another million will flee their country. And it's all because 
a land that produces a lot of food was exported by the Brits. We know now Tony Blair apologized to the Irish in 1997. Uh, we're sorry, old boy. You know, but they, that they caused a famine. That it was, we didn't have that term genocide then, but they were exporting oats, they were exporting milk, they were exporting beef and pork and everything. You know, it's, all the food that Ireland produced was going out. And little children are chewing on grass with their green stained teeth, and they're reusing the coffins because they're so poor. It's just utter calamity. And he comes from that, but he comes from wealth. But it radicalizes the Irish. So they have one of their many failed revolutions <laughs> because the Royal Navy, you know, the British Empire is the most powerful empire on earth. And they're like, nice little town you got here, Dublin. We could level it in an afternoon just without even going on shore. The Royal Navy is just firing cannonballs. So he's arrested. And again, all his revolutionaries were journalists. The one time we got into it. And <laughs> miserable failures, but uh, you know, a poet. Has a poet ever won a war? And it's tough. It's tough you know, when you're going against the Royal Navy. He's sentenced to be hanged drawn and quartered, and his remains disposed of as Her Majesty shall see fit. And Her Majesty is Queen Elizabeth I, and she's, you know, I saw the PBS series, she looked sort of hot, actually, when she was younger. <laughs> and uh, she commutes his sentence from hanged, drawn, and quartered, and dragged through the streets of Dublin, which is really what they did, to lifetime exile in Tasmania. Oh, great, you'll never see Ireland. He gets on this ship and he just weeps. Now, the Brits made a mistake. They put all the intellectuals, the Irish intellectuals, in Tasmania. The others were slave labor on the mainland. So, you know, they, they had a little community and stuff. But he escapes from Tasmania, comes to the US, and then that's two iterations. So he's already fought for Ireland. Now, and when he's in Tasmania, he's writing under, a, he's a journalist, he's writing under a pseudonym for Australian independence. He's writing against the Brits. And Tasmania gets its into some degree of independence before Australia because of his you know, poison pen. So he's, he's affected places on two continents already, okay? because Ireland eventually does get its independence when they resurrect his writings. Australia eventually gets its independence. Now he comes to America. And these Irish aren't considered full citizens. So he founds the Irish Brigade. We'll give our lives on behalf of the Union cause. And ultimately, millions of African Americans are freed in part I don't want to give them too much credit, but in part because of the loss of lives of those people. That's three continents that he's affected. And then finally he comes to Montana. And what's going on when he comes to Montana? Arguably the biggest vigilante campaign <laughs> in the history of the United States. There's a little clique of rich landowners who are basically having an extrajudicial government, taking out and hanging people you know, who are on the wrong side of them, basically. Now, my theory, and it's not original, I won't take credit for it, it's backed by other scholars, is that your second territorial governor was murdered. For years and years and years, they said he was a drunken Irishman who fell off his boat. And you know there couldn't be a bigger stereotype. Well, there could be, but that's one of them. The kids throwing the potatoes is pretty bad. Um, and so the, the, um, they did a mock trial about 15 years ago. They brought in a jury. They had a prosecutor. And they had a trial, and they, they found that Marr was murdered. He wasn't drunk at all. He was suffering from dysentery. He'd been on a horse for five days going north. And so when he fell into the Missouri, they think he was pushed. They never found his body. So you know, I just love this story. And next time you look at the statue, hopefully you'll think that there's a, there's a live person in it. And by the way, he did all this. He changed the world on three continents and died at the age of 43, which is just so remarkable that you could have that much life. The woman he wrote that beautiful letter to, that 10-page letter, and she was a Protestant. He was a Catholic. She came from a lot of wealth, and his, her family said, if you marry that guy, you're disowned. She died a poor widow on an army pension. But he wrote this letter. He said, I am an exile. I have no family. He could never go back to Ireland. He said, I am alone in the world, but if you will take me as your wife, I will make you a full partner. I will share, it is ahead of his time, I will share everything with her, with you. She followed him to the Civil War, nursed his wounds in the tent after he got wounded. He was twice shot off a horse. She followed him to Montana. She wasn't that happy with Virginia City. Um, 
you can go to the little, as I did, the little cabin that was the governor's mansion. It's, it's been improved a little bit, but there was this little off-slope rat infested. I mean, she cried when she saw it. And Virginia City was lawless. Um, and they walked into this vigilante thing. So, I mean, the Montana episode of his life alone could be just a great story, too. So I, I, just, I just love the story. That's what drew me to it. And again, there's, there's lots of the same, all the things we're talking about. You know, free press, the ability for the, the written word to change worlds, um, prejudice and dark hatred and how that builds into all these things. Just all this stuff courses through it. What I find remarkable is that in Helena every, every summer, uh, or I guess it's uh, in the spring, um, the local high schools have the um, vigilante parade. <laughs> so in, in Helena, we, we celebrate the vigilantes, uh, not the territorial governor who, who fought them. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, you should come sometime. Right. <laughs> most, most of us at Helena avoid downtown uh, that, that weekend. Um, well, I know we, we've got some folks who want to ask some questions. So we've got a couple of microphones out there. Um, if you've got a question, that you, we've, got a, we've got time for maybe um, four or five questions. Um, so raise your hand, we'll, and we'll try to get around the room. Um, but while we're identifying hands raised, There's I'm going to ask uh, one last thing, um, which is uh, just, just briefly comment on, you know, we, we talked about this, this history being a dark history and a forgotten history. Mm -hmm. And right now there's a conversation taking place around the country around how we should be dealing with the uncomfortable right. parts of our history. Um, Ken Burns, I, I'm not sure if he was writing about you, your book specifically, but he had written at some point uh, in an op-ed for the New York Times that the dark chapters of American history have just as much to teach us, if not more, than the glorious ones, and often the two are intertwined. Right. So I'm one of those, and, and that's a great quote from Ken, and I use it in my talks on this. I don't think we should be afraid of history. I, I really don't. I, I, and I really also think it makes us stronger. No family in America is perfect. No nation is perfect. We all, you, you go into your family, my wife says, the further back you go into our family history, the more you're likely to find a horse thief. And I think that's true of a lot of families as well. I, I think of these people who now want to just teach a, a one-sided, look, I'm not for woke history, which is one side, but I'm also not for the other, I call it the smiley button side of history. And I, I keep thinking of this New Yorker cartoon I saw, and it's, um, it's an artist, and he's drawing a picture, but it's a smiley button. It says, Van Gogh on meds. <laughs> and I keep thinking, is that what they want? I mean, they want to just draw smiley buttons, paper it over. You know, you can have a glorious history because you overcame that. I mean, that's why I think I get big crowds in Indiana, because they say, we did beat those bastards. One woman stood up and, and you know, rolled them back. One prosecutor, one editor you know, alone among these people, went against the tide. They should be proud of that. That's a good history. That teaches lessons to kids. You can stand up to evil. So why are we afraid of that? Will it make us feel less about our country? No, it'll make us see it for all its nuances, I think. I, I don't, again, I don't believe in writing all the warts and all. I, I'm against some of the excesses of wokeism, totally against it. I hate it. You know, America ho-hum. You know, it's all bad. I don't like that. But I also don't like the other. And so I think that you know, um, we should leave it up to, you know, people who know better, but we shouldn't be afraid of it. And, and this is the point I made earlier. If you tell it well, people will make their own conclusions. Just tell them the story. Just lay it out. Put all the flesh and blood and bones on it, and people will arrive at their own conclusions as long as you give them the truth, the true story. All right. Hi, um, I'm in a nonfiction book group, and a couple of years ago we read The Irish General, and next month we're discussing The Big Burn. And so the question that that group wants to, would want to ask is, where do you get your, how do you choose your topics? You've talked about that a little bit, but yeah. I'm sure you get in, there are a lot of questions that come up in your daily round that you don't pursue. Is there some other through line? in your books? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I, the first thing is what I mentioned earlier, 
and I think as a storyteller, you, you can't, you have to be open to, to things happening, to stumbling across stuff. Um, and if you're not, you'll just, you know, you won't, you won't stumble upon these things. You just have to be, there's no other way to put it. You have to be open to serendipity. But, you know, in a book, I'm sure there's a bunch of authors in here, you live the story. It's like having a relationship. You know, you're, you're, you're going to live this thing. So you better like the story, or you better like what you're, what the impact will be. I didn't like the Klansmen, but I liked the fact that there were some heroes here. And I couldn't wait to get this thing out to see how it's going to be received. It's been remarkably well received, which really surprises me. But, you know, so one of the other questions is, can I live this thing for three or four years? Can I get up every day and just think constantly about this thing? And, that's a t and then a third thing is, I want to have the voices be alive. I've got to have memoirs, letters, diaries. The great thing about the Dust Bowl book from my perspective was there are living human beings. They're all dead now. I did this book in the early, 20th, early 21st century. They were in their 90s. I could look into the eyes of a 97-year-old woman who lived in a sod house and saw the earth turn inside out, saw literally storms that were um, 100 miles wide and a mile high. Just imagine the cabinet range on the move over the prairie. That's what it was, of all dust. And so I look in their eyes, and I wouldn't see a 97-year-old. I'd see a 17-year-old. And every now and then, this magical thing would happen. One of these women, they're almost always women, because they outlive the men. And I hate to say this, they're better storytellers. The guys were just, eh, it was bad. <laughs> and, and I'd say, well, well, how bad? And they go, real bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, one of these women would go into a back room, and I'd hear her sort of stumbling around, and she'd come back, kind of shaky, and have a shoebox. Open up the shoebox, and out pops history, letters, pictures diaries, notes, pieces of hair, all the stuff that's the living stuff, you know, the artifacts of that time. And so, long way to answer your question, I want to have good voices. And Thomas Marr left behind so much wonderful writing, I could get inside his head. Um, in the Klan book, there's a lot, a lot of oral history and contemporaneous stuff I could tell what the character, Madge Oberholzer, the heroine, the woman who stopped the Klan, on her deathbed, I'm spoiling the story, wrote out a 10-page thing that just bared her soul. She'd been sexually violated. She'd been cannibalized. He actually chewed her. And he became such a monster that he, 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 when he attacked these women, he would cannibalize them too. But she put this son of a bitch away because she lay, put out this 10, and I read this thing, and I was just chills. In the same, in an opposite way, too, reading the letter that Thomas Marr wrote to the woman he wanted to share his life with. So I look for voices. Can I find a strong voice, you know? And um, sometimes it, sometimes I, so I wanted to do something completely dis different in the last couple of years. I was going to write a book about water. I love the West. I've always written about the West. I want to do a big, I thought we were at this moment where water, which is so determinative of how we live in the West, you know, climate change is drying it up. The Great Salt Lake was two years from disappearing. The Central Valley of California had gone sunk 12 feet underground. They were looking at the Grand Coulee and saying, I wonder if we're going to have a piece of the, of the Columbia River. So I thought, this is one of these moments. Water has so shaped our history in the West that I could write it. But then we had these epic storms <laughs> that refilled the Great Salt Lake. <laughs> and, Tulare Lake, which is the second biggest lake in the West. Most people don't even know about it. It's in Southern California. It had disappeared for 50 years. It reappeared in the Central Valley, which used to be all one underwater thing. So I said, I'll put that one on hold for a few years. I still think you should write that one. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's, I, I read this book called Cadillac Desert. Amazing book. Yeah, and I was really influenced by that. So yeah. I thought this is one of those moments where water is really going to shape us again. Yeah, so. And that book needs an update. Yeah, it does. Well, he, fortunately, he's dead. I know. That's yeah. why you can do the sequel. Well, thanks for the encouragement. <laughs> I hope your mom approves. <laughs> we, have, we got a question over here. Oh. I just want to say there is a sequel to Cadillac Desert. Uh, it's called, I can't think of the name of it. It's a great book. Go with it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Uh, do we have a couple Hi. more questions? Uh, oh. I actually have the mic. <laughs> oh, great. Sorry, I, I, couldn't, I can't see with the lights. Yeah, it's I can't right. see you either. Um, and I'm not even sure that this is, I don't know, the, I, I'm just going to go for it. Okay. So we're talking about the press and we're talking about um, uh, the history, right, and the things that you've seen. And I'm wondering how, or if you have an opinion on how the press at any time can police itself. For example, um, and you've got a lot of entities out there that mm -hmm. claim that they're the press and they're not actually reporting facts. And so when you have one entity that says X and you have another entity that says Y, what is the obligation of, of ethical journalists to call out the other people? Well, the aptly named constitutional scholar to my right, John Adams, um, is probably more qualified to answer than that. I'll take a stab and then you should take a stab at it. All the so-called mainstream press runs these fact checks. Now, I think you should have, at the coming debate, real-time fact checks. If you could actually scroll underneath, because it's pretty easy to fact check a lot of, if you say, you know, half the states now allow infanticide to happen, you can kill a baby at nine months, which is not true at all. Or if you say, um, well, like this thing that happened in Britain, there's so many examples, but you can real-time fact check so that people have that information. I don't know, I'm sorry to say I think that these fact checks that the mainstream papers all run don't really change anything. They say, you know, they run for the left or the right. They say Kamala Harris misspoke yesterday. She said these things. Walls said these things. Trump, you know, he, he documented by the Washington Post 30,000 lies or misstatements in the last four years. And it's just, you know, he lies by way of respiration. I'm sorry. <laughs> And that's, how do you fact check that? How do you, you know, um, he said two days ago on a right wing thing, it's terrible the way they treated Mark Pence, Mike Pence. And it's like, wait, <laughs> terrible the way Kamala Harris treated Mike Pence? I mean, it's projection, of course. So I don't know. I mean, in the past, they used to have these kind of media watchdog groups, and they would ultimately just become partisan. They would be funded by a conservative group or by a liberal group. That, that has an axe to grind, and so they, they're not really good. You got any views on that, Mark? Well, I, as a matter of fact, I do. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I think in today's day and age, a big part of it is looking at um, the, are these organizations transparent or not? I mean, some part of it, uh, I, know, I know Lee loves to talk about uh, uh, public media literacy. That's a joke. He, the other day he said, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to talk about media literacy anymore. <laughs> but I do, think that there is a, um, I do think that there is a responsibility from readers to, to pay attention to where are you getting your information. When you get that social media thing that, that makes you feel something, usually anger or um, you know, mocking uh, you know, somebody who doesn't share your beliefs or what have you, um, before you forward that on or repost it, maybe take, take a second to fact check it yourself, right? Um, or look for those organizations that are transparent. Who are, who are their writers? Who are their funders? Who are their editors? Who are the, what are their policies? Uh, you know, and I think one of the things that sets us apart from, from a lot of other digital news organizations, digital news organizations, is organizations like Montana Free Press that are members of larger um, groups like the Institute for Nonprofit News, or the local independent online news publishers, or the Society of Professional Journalists, or the Montana Newspaper Association. Um, we join these groups and we participate in these things because we, we all stand for a higher standard of truth and transparency. Um, if these groups, if these other news organizations aren't committed to those standards of truth and transparency, they maybe aren't worth your time. Um, and so, you know, it's, I don't know that it's really our job so much to be policing who, what other news organizations, uh, news organizations are doing. But we do, uh, we, and ha at Montana Free Press, we have written about other so-called news organizations when they've popped up um, purporting to look and act and feel like news when really what they have is, is a, an agenda. They have um, lar usually a partisan agenda. Uh, and so we have written about that in the past, and I think other news organizations have written about that in the past. But I also think the public, it's incumbent on the public to, to take a little bit more ownership 
and a little bit more um, initiative in where you're getting your news and how you're re-presenting that news to your social networks. Um, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, X, TikTok, whatever we're talking about here, if your impulse is to hit you know, share or forward or whatever, before you've taken at least a few minutes to even question whether or not this thing that you're reading is true, then you're also part of the problem. <laughs> Um, so I think that's, that's part of the media literacy that we need to be working on together is, is a little restraint and, and pursuit of uh, the truth um, ourselves. Yeah. And I'll just add one more thing to us, and this has been, been one of my personal campaigns. I think no, in order to become a citizen of this democracy, no student, no high school senior should be allowed to graduate without passing a course in media literacy so that you can tell crap from not from the truth. You can't drive a car until you pass a driver's license test. Why are you allowed to become a citizen if you can't tell truth from crap? I mean, I just, it's a, and it's, there, there are doing it. A lot of schools are now teaching basic media literacy that allow people to do the kind of things you just said. And it's just asking the questions, where is it coming from? Who's the generator of that? You know, so you, it's, it's, it wouldn't be hard to teach this, but it would allow much more enlightened citizens because they would have the tool. There is an instructor in this room who is teaching a course at this university called bullshit. Calling Bullshit. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay, Thank we'll, take, you. we'll take a couple more. I, I don't know if yours counts, but go ahead. <laughs> I, I'm surprised John recognized me at all. Uh, I'm his father. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Tim, first, first of all, I want to thank you for being here this evening and sharing your thoughts. Uh, secondly, I taught high school American history for 35 years in a public school, and I did not use the textbook very much. Um, I just thought there was an agenda there, and I, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on uh, American history textbooks. Oh, boy. <laughs> Sorry. You know, uh, well, yeah. I said earlier there's no boring history. There's just boringly told history. My peeve is twofold with some of the textbooks. They are boring. They're like statues and, you know, great men did great things. And then, you know. Great well, white men, mostly. Right, exactly. And they, they, it, history is clash of ideas, history is clash of individuals, drama. I mean, just think how close we came to not going into World War II. Franklin Roosevelt hadn't been elected in the late 1930s to his third term. Lindbergh had been elected and we wouldn't have fought the Nazis. There's so many what ifs you can teach in just history and make it really interesting. Um, when I was doing the Dust Bowl book, I was just wrapped up in this thing. I, I literally would cry sometimes when I'd come home from these interviews with these elderly women. And my kid was taking advanced placement American history. And I grabbed his history book. I go to the back. I look for Dust Bowl. And I, one paragraph. And this is the largest human-caused environmental catastrophe. It was human-caused. I'm not going to go into chapter and verse why it was. You can read the book and see. But everyone agrees it was human-caused. We ripped up the sod and tore it off. And then they couldn't hold the dirt in place. And it merits one. And it's got so many lessons. You think climate change is some distant abstract? They changed the climate during the Dust Bowl. They, a area the size of Pennsylvania was ruined, rendered useless for a long time. There's great lessons. There's great drama. And so I was really pissed. One paragraph. And I go through these. i got to control myself. I go through these things where I get angry like that. Um, and you know, so, But I haven't been reviewing them lately. My kid's out of high school now. so. We've got uh, time for one more, I'm sorry. And we're, we're going to stick around for continued conversation and, and, and uh, fellowship. But we've got one more question over here. Uh, and then we're going to have to uh, yeah. call it a quit. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm oh, right the here. <laughs> I am a graduate of the University of Washington Journalism School. And Joni was my professor. I had the opportunity to take column writing with um, Timothy's wife. And I learned in that class that columns are where we get to place our opinion. And I wonder 
what your perspective is on the change in headlines of hard news. And if most people are getting their news via social media and the headlines are largely opinion pieces, even on factual articles, how we can um, encourage a more educated electorate to read beyond the headline and perhaps encourage journalists to shift how they use headlines yeah, rather than it's really for clickbait. Question. And a fellow dog, fellow husky here, if you just allow me one, one husky indulgence. So when I got hired by the New York Times in 1989, I had a huge chip on my shoulder because I go back to New York and they're all Ivy Leaguers. And I'm from this public school, and you know, I just, I was just had this thing. Oh, Princeton, Harvard, Princeton, Harvard. This is like the Supreme Court. All of them Ivy Leaguers. <laughs> and there was this one woman who went to the University of Michigan. We were great friends because we were the two public university people. But I had taken a class at the UW um, in libel and um, media law. I knew more than the Harvard Princeton types about what you could say and what you couldn't say on defamation, on libel. I knew the rules. I knew Times versus Sullivan, the great founding you know, court case on what you can say about a public figure. And they did not. And I thought, boy, I cherish my UW <laughs> education for that. So that's my plug for that. Now, uh, David Brooks, my colleague at the New York Times, has a column tomorrow. Uh, it's it, one of his dispiriting ones. He goes between highs and lows always, you know, where he's, uh, we're all getting along to it, we're all, we're all falling apart. But he writes well about community and the human heart. And he really is a big-hearted guy. I've gotten to know him pretty well. And he said, what's happened in social media is it's, it's a dopamine hit that it just chemically affects you when you read something that reinforces your bias. Mm -hmm. And so you keep going, I want more, I want more, I want more. You keep going down the rabbit hole. Your question on the headlines, that's what those are all about. They're all about getting you in to get the dopamine hit. Whereas before, you would say, um, you know, recount, we just had a recount in Washington State in the State Lands Commissioner race. The guy was ahead by 51 votes. This, by the way, this is about why mail-in voting is not a fraud. We've had mail-in voting for a long time. They did this exhaustive recount. It changed by two votes. He won by 49 votes instead of 51 votes. Instead of the headline being, recount shows that so-and-so wins Lands Commissioner race, the bias sides would say fraud at polls. You know, remember that scene in Citizen Kane where he's running for governor, he's running for president, he says, prepare two headlines. Kane wins presidency, fraud at polls. <laughs> and so, yeah, and, and, but what Brooks is calling, I urge you all to read it tomorrow, it's, on, it's posted now, is that, it, that, that, and I never knew this, you actually get that little dopamine hit, and the headlines lead, lead you down to that. So, I mean, there's a, again, it's, we're singing from the same tune. There's all the more reason to, to, to have and support and trust actual professional journalists. What a great way to close. Yeah. <laughs> well, Tim, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for and, having uh, me. Thanks to all of you for coming to the opening evening of the Montana Free Press Fest. Uh, we hope you will stick around and join us for conversations and panels uh, tomorrow and also uh, on Saturday. We've got a great lineup of conversations and, and discussions that we want you to be a part of. If you, don't, uh, if you just got a ticket tonight, we hope you'll consider stopping by the box office and, and uh, getting tickets for tomorrow and, and Saturday as well. Uh, and with that, uh, please join us in the back of the room where we're going to continue the conversation over uh, drinks and appetizers. Uh, for the next hour or so. So thanks everybody for coming tonight. Wow, look at that bar.